Hi, this is Misha. And since I had a, a number of them today, some are my own and some are from a batch of guns I'm selling for a friend, I thought we would look at the evolution, or rather devolution, of the Japanese Arasaka Type 99. Now this would be the version chambered in 7.7 .7 that was developed in the late 30s and really went into production in 1940. You could argue 1939, but really 1940 for all intents and purposes. Now we have individual videos on a number of these and several other variations such as the Naval Special and the Type 2 Paratrooper. So for really more detail, check those out. But I just wanted to kind of lay them all out in a row, more or less chronologically, and talk about where this rifle began and really where it ended. Uh, full disclosure, I don't really know how to pronounce Japanese, and my speech program sure as hell does not, so bear with me. Essentially, we have three major factories that made these in large numbers. You had the original Nagoya, which spanned from the beginning through Series 12. You have Kokora, which spanned from Series 20 to 25. And you had Toyo Kokio, which spanned from Series 30 to Series 35. Now you have some smaller manufacturing too, for example, you have Tokyo Juki Kogio, which was 27 and 37, although it did not complete either series. You have the Jensen Arsenal, which was in Korea, which actually got involved very late in the war and produced under 100,000 total as part of series 40. And you have the Mukden Arsenal in J uh, in China, which actually produced just a few thousand, very small production. You also have some very small productions which were actually under Nagoya supervision from Hawa and Ijawa. And we'll mention those, but really they 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 just, they just made a few tens of thousands. All told, we have seven factories in Japan that worked with Type 99 production, plus the two factories in mainland Asia. So where do we begin? Right here, we have the original Type 99. This is a Series 1 from Nagoya. This was adopted in 1939. Obviously, it is a long rifle with a 31-inch barrel. This is essentially like a late production Type 38, but in the larger caliber. Also, we have the fold-down monopod. And we have the anti-aircraft sights here. And of course we have the dust cover. Notice it has the bottom sling mounts, peep rear sight, protected front sight, we have a long cleaning rod, it's actually held in with a spring loaded button here which is kind of unique. And this takes the standard type 30 bayonet, which had been in use since the late 19th century. We still have the cupped metal butt plate. We do have the two-piece wooden stock back here, although it's quite joined very nicely on this one. A plum-shaped bolt handle. And a nicely checkered safety Early on, these guns were made with a very high degree in fit and finish, and the original plan was to make a long rifle and a carbine with a 19-inch barrel. However, tests soon revealed that that really was not necessary, that the short rifle pattern, as we have here, with a 25 and a half inch barrel, would be perfectly fine. 
the loss in accuracy was very minor from the long rifle. However, compared with a carbine firing the 7.7, .7, we have much less muzzle flash, flip, sound, and we have better accuracy. It was just a much more pleasant and effective rifle. So the short rifle became the de facto standard in 1940, and they only produced about 38,000 long rifles, and they never really took the carbine into production. It never left the prototype stage. This is essentially the exact same gun as the long rifle. We have a fold-down monopod here. This one's a little stiff, which is good. A lot of them are really loose. While the pattern is identical, they are not interchangeable for a few reasons. Shorter barrel being one. But also we have a side sling mount instead. A bit of a carryover from a carbine. Back here too. We have anti-aircraft sights still. Again, they're a little bit different from the long rifle, but not by much. It's basically just a shortened version. This would be the version adopted and produced in large numbers. and would be what was in production through 1942. As I said, these began at Nagoya. Toyo Kogio also made some long rifles and would soon transition over to the short. Kokora would never make a long, so they began in 1940 with the short rifle. And so we have our three manufacturers beginning. Now, so that gets the base set. The rest of these out here really show the economies of war. Now, Japan was not at all the only nation to simplify its rifle production during World War II. But the Arasaka is actually quite unique in how much it changed between 1942, late in that year, through 1945 when the war ended. Pulling this one out here. We have really all the same features as before, but one of the very first things to go was that monopod. When it would first disappear, the lug below would still remain in the barrel band, and we would still have a split barrel band up here, but they would never even drill this out below for the pod. The anti-aircraft sights would remain though, at least for a time into 1943. We would also keep our long cleaning rod still retained with a button. And all the other features early on. So the monopod was effectively the first to go. Now this rifle is interesting. This is actually a Kokora Series 24, so quite a late production gun. What makes it interesting is we still retain the anti-aircraft sights. But by this point, they would no longer be shipping these with dust covers. The safety is getting a little simplified. We're still checkered here, but not as nice as was before. The stock also has some chatter here. And the bluing quality would go down. But what makes this one interesting, the lug for the monopod is gone, yet we still have the early style split wide barrel band. Now looking at this end, we see another early change. That long cleaning rod would soon disappear in 1943 and be replaced with this small and effectively useless thing. It's essentially a sinker. You basically tie a rope to it and throw it down your bore. To be fair, these rods were always just used for emergency field. Most of the time, the 
unit would have cleaning kits and share amongst themselves that were kept on their belt. But I just thought this was interesting. The first couple we looked at were Nagoya's. Wanted to show the Kokora. Now we're going to go back to a Nagoya here. And this illustrates something else. Now we have our short cleaning rods on this one. Full length handguard, protected front sight. Now notice this barrel band lacks the lug for the monopod, but it, and it also lacks the split at the top. You can kind of see where it would have been just in the machining, but basically the split is gone. It's a solid band now. Likewise, the slots for the anti-aircraft sights are gone on the rear sight. Quite a few guns would also be manufactured with the spots for the anti-aircraft sights, but they would never be attached from the factory. This still has the full tall front sight. Essentially the same length and everything, just no aircraft sights. And here we see something that Nagoya went to also quite early on, the cylindrical caulking handle. This is welded or brazed onto the bolt body. It's actually a little bit longer. But what's interesting, and this really shows after looking at that other one that was made later in the war than this, each factory started to really do their own thing by 1944, if not even 43. So because Nagoya would adopt a simplification does not necessarily mean that Kokora would. As I said, the bluing would go down later on, and then the lacquering would get more rushed along with the machining of the stock itself. But this is still a 99, Type 99 style rifle. We still have a chrome line bore and chamber. We still have full effective sights. Still have a, a semblance of a cleaning rod. But that was really when things began to get desperate and Japan found itself with very few resources. This is a similar Nagoya. It has a couple of important changes though. We still have the short cleaning rod, all this. Barrel band here. It's a slightly different style. It's no longer welded in quite the same fashion. They're still simplifying it further. Another simplification, since the anti-aircraft sights are gone, we've gone to a short ladder sight, still adjustable as you see. And that was actually used very briefly. If you look at the safety here, you'll see another transitional change. They went from the kind of convex checkering to this flat-faced diagonal line ribbing there. And again, this was used very briefly. I really don't know if other factories used it, but I know this is predominantly found within the Goyas. For our last Nagoya here, we go to a full last ditch. We looked at series sixes and sevens there. By series eight, we're into full last ditch production at Nagoya. This is a series 10, and it has all the simplifications that you know and love. So we have an unprotected front sight. We have a very crudely welded, but still there, bayonet lug. We do not have a provision for any kind of cleaning rod now. We have a new three-piece stock. This is a separate piece just held in by the barrel bands. We still have the two pieces back here dovetailed together. We've also slimmed down, shortened the upper handguard to save on wood. This exposes more of the barrel and you can see the rushed machining, the lathe. Sling swivel, barrel band are pretty well unchanged. We have a simplified rear sight that is fixed. 
it actually presents the same sight picture. It just is no longer adjustable. This would have definitely not had a dust cover at this point, even though we still have the grooves for it. I think it was just a leftover. We have the cylindrical bolt handle that Nagoya used starting quite early on. We have a blob welded safety. There's actually a large number of variations with this safety and the way the weld was done. It was dressed better or worse, so on and so forth. One interesting change they made, probably for using lower grade wood, they went to a larger recoil lug in the stock here. This one, they took the finger grooves out of the stock. Others we'll look at will retain them longer. We still have a dished in trigger guard with the cutouts in the back for a finger, so that's still a little bit nice on the machining front. Flipping it over, we have the one screw rear swivel. This was something quite unique to Nagoya. Toyo Juki Kogio would also use it. but other uh, factories would keep on with the two. And probably most famously, we have gone to the wood butt plate held on with nails. Most would have three nails, but some late Nagoyas would only have two. Now, at this point, this is a Series 10, we probably still have a chrome line bore but it would be intermittent. Now Nagoya would make it all the way through series 11, each series having 100,000 guns. They would begin series 12, but they would only get about 1,200 guns in before the surrender of Japan at the end of the war. So that's my last uh, of the Nagoyas. A couple of uh, other guns from other factories. I think this variation is quite unique. This is a Series 27. I'll just start calling it TJK because I know I'm butchering the Japanese. Apologies on that. This is a relatively early 27, but since they began during the war, even from the very beginning, they look quite crude. What's interesting is we basically have a last ditch or substitute as it really was known 99 barreled action see it's an unprotected front sight fixed rear sight in an earlier stock if you notice there are the cutouts for the early style barrel band with the hole for the screw plugged there's even some inletting back here We still have the earlier style small lug. Nicely crudely machined metal here. This trigger guard is actually cruder than on that uh, Series 10. And kind of quite funnily, you can see where this was originally meant to have a two screw rear swivel and just has a one because the inlet is there. Even with the butt plate, this has the wood butt plate, but you can see at the top here where they originally intended it to have the metal cupped. What they were doing at this point, and this happened at a lot of factories, they were using previously rejected parts, in this case a stock. This stock was made earlier and wasn't used on a gun for whatever reason, a crack or a flaw or whatever. You'll start to see this more and more in the war. They will revisit er earlier parts that didn't pass spec and so even with late war rifles, once in a while you'll find an early war style part on them. Maybe with a small flaw, but let me get over here. There we go. So it makes it really quite interesting. Now here we have a late Series 27. In fact, so late we don't even have a serial number. 
this was in its own video. This is my so-called rope hole. See that hole there? If you flip it over, you'll notice it never had a rear sling swivel. They simply drilled a hole in the stock for a, well, rope. I'll let you guess why it has the nickname it does. There is not a sling swivel on the front here on this barrel band either. The rope would simply loop around. Pretty much every other thing about this is pretty standard. Last ditch, no cleaning rod, roughly machined everything. One interesting point is this does not have the cuts for the dust cover. So late in the war, those cutouts would disappear on some of the receivers. We still have a welded safety. This one's reasonably okay dressed, but we still have the cylindrical bolt knob there. No finger grooves in the stock. Definitely a late stock and receiver on this critter. And this would be made at the tail end of TJK production for sure. Nagoya would also do a few rope holes, but those would be the main two. Moving on, we have a recent addition to my collection that a friend sent me last week. As I said, early on, Toyo Kogio would make guns. They would even make long rifles along with Nagoya. Well, this is a late Toyo Kogio. This is a Series 35. The last known serials are around 58,000. This one's in the 30,000s. So it wasn't made at the tail end of the war, but it was made in the summer. It's a last ditch gun for sure. But it still has a few features, such as the finger grooves in the stock. We're still using the more or less plum-shaped bolt handle styling. The safety is welded, of course. Wood butt plate, of course. One screw swivel there. Flat trigger guard. For whatever reason, though, the Series 25 guns do seem to be made a little nicer than their contemporaries at the time. If you compare a Series 10 or 11 to with a Series 25, a late Series 27, to a Series 35, the 35 is generally looking a little nicer, um, better bluing, a little nicer carving on the wood stock. This one still has a chrysanthemum. Quite a number of these were captured after the war because of uh, the factory being near Hiroshima. This would have been made a few months before the bombs were dropped. And we have an older video showing a, a very, very late production bring back 35, series 35 too. Moving on. We have one of the Kokora Series 25s I was talking about. I really like the 25s. They can get pretty rough. And this is a quite a late 25. Kokora would stop production around 92,000, 91, 92,000. So they wouldn't quite complete their last series. And, you know, for the most part, it's like all the others. The barrel band up here is even further simplified. It, it lost the little washer around the screw. We have pretty roughly machined barrel. This one's not too bad as far as 25s go. Oh, that's pretty normal. No uh, grooves in the stock. Interestingly, they quit kind of chamfering the edges here of the rear sight. It's very square. That seems to be something that the Kokora did or rather did not do. They were still using the plum bolt handle as well. Although this one's relatively roughly machined, and I've even seen some rougher in the 25 series. We do have a rough weld. We do have the flat trigger guard. It's not dished. It doesn't have the inletting in the back for your finger. 
The floor plate is very angular how it was cut out. The stock is very chattery at the wrist here. We still have the two swivel, or two screw rear swivel, of course. That is a Kakura thing. And we have the wooden butt plate. By this point, your bores are probably not going to be chrome lined unless they're an older barrel that was rejected and reused. And they even went to a shorter firing pin striker spring in some of these late guns. That's kind of interesting. They were even saving on springs. And wood could be all over the place. I mean, they, they were using whatever wood they could get their hands on. And finally, this gun over here has its own video, but this is really the last of the last ditch. At least it gives the rope pole a run for its money. This is a Series 40 from Jensen in Korea. This is a very late 40. And the reason I showed it in this video is it does have some interesting features. It has a very simplified square flat type front barrel band. This leads many collectors to call these Jensen specials. They basically just clamshelled it together and welded it together over the barrel. I'm not even sure this has a pin. I don't think it does. I think it's just welded. Barrel is very roughly machined. Still have a sling swivel. Kind of interesting. Some of these, like this one here, still use the wide split bridge top rear barrel band. See the very coarse welds in the bottom. It's very coarsely hammered together. Also interestingly, the rear sight's a little different. It sits further forward on the block compared with many of the others. This has the finger grooves, but they're very roughly machined and very shallow. Some late Jensen's would have these, others would not. Trigger guard is very late style. Bolt, very late style. Very roughly machined. We still do have a two screw rear swivel here. And a nailed on butt plate, which seems to be pretty much a universal. So that's an example. I don't have a Muckton because they're quite uncommon to rare, especially in the 99s. You can find more 38s, so 6.5 millimeter Mucktons. The Hawa in Ijwa were actually made as part of series nine under Nagoya supervision. One factory would do the first half, the other factory would do the second half. So that's why they, I wouldn't really chunk them down as a major manufacturer, especially since Nagoya was supervising them. So it's quite of interesting. Now there is not a series 13 through 19. There's not a 26 that I'm aware of. So not all series were used because of how the Japanese government assigned blocks of manufacturing based on the Japanese alphabet to each manufacturer. Unfortunately we don't have records from the war so we have to go by observation trying to figure out when things were made. But it's still a really fun research project. If you haven't figured out by now, we have quite a few videos on Japanese guns, so if any of this interests you or anything else, uh, you check out our playlist and other videos because we go into more detail about the development and more of the combat history. As I said, some of these are mine, some of them are from a collection I'm selling. I just wanted to line them up because I can tell you all day, hey, they transition from aircraft sight to no aircraft sight, monopod to no monopod. But just, I think, seeing it really would give a hopefully, hopefully a good visual representation and really just drive home where the rifle began and where it ended up. And as I said at the beginning, each of the factories did its own thing more and more as the war went on.
So while you have guns like the Series 35, which still maintained a certain degree of fit and finish by the summer of 1945, you have guns coming out of, say, Jensen and TJK that just pretty much, they worked, maybe. And I've even heard speculation that some of the TJKs from Series 37 aren't safe to shoot. So I hope you enjoyed this overview. Again, if you have interest in any of these in particular, you might check out our playlist to get more information. And if you like the video, please click like. If you have not already subscribed, we'd appreciate it if you could do so. If you'd like to help support the channel, please check out our Patreon page. As always, we appreciate you tuning in, and we'll catch you next time.